They say, great results requires great work. Good people put their work in with Jutain Fit. Personal instructor, Rob Ski, certified in fitness and nutrition. Tell them Blanco sent you good people. Easy. Good people, good people, what's rocking? You now tuned in, OG Sonny Blocko. I got a story to tell you. Hey, eh? today, part two, part two of the men who built Black America, Black History Month, right? Why not? And this presentation will be featuring Alex Pompel, Baron Wilkins, and Ellsworth Raymond. Johnson, better known as Bumpy Johnson. Good people, you already know. Get your popcorn, get your drinks, get your get right, whatever your get right is, because it's movie time. Enjoy the presentation. First on the list, Senor Alejandro Alex Pompey, born May 3rd. 1890 in Key West, Florida. Born to Afro-Cuban parents, Jose and Loretta Pompey. His father, Jose, was a lawyer and a cigar manufacturer. He was also on the board of directors for the Key West chapter of the Cuban Revolutionary Party. He was elected to the Florida House of Representatives as a Republican in 1892. He was a state representative until his death in 1897. After the death of Mr. Pompey, the family struggled, and young Alex, wanting to do better for himself and the family, decided to move to Harlem in 1910. Uptown, Alex became a major policy banker. With his proceeds, he got into baseball, owning the New York Stars of the Eastern Colored League, also the New York Cubans of the Negro National League in 1923. The numbers game, the numbers were great for Alex during the 1920s, but in 1932, he was forced to join Jewish mobster Dutch Schultz. With his connections to Schultz, this led him to his indictment in 1936 for his involvement in policy rackets. The New York District Attorney Thomas Dewey selected Alex as one of the targets in the crackdown on the city's racketeering. Pompey was tipped off by some people inside the DA's office and he fled to Mexico. He was eventually arrested in Mexico, but Mexican authorities refused to extradite him. Pompey decided to return to the U.S. as a state witness. Yeah, good people, yeah, you heard me right. Good old Pompey, he started working with the boys, he went bad, he started cooperating, right? Pompey is considered the only man who survived after turning informant against other racketeers. In 1948, sensing that baseball's integration would change the Negro League, Pompey arranged for the New York Cubans to become a minor affiliate of the New York Giants. Nah, people, not the football team, the Giants. Back in the day, there was a baseball team called the New York Giants. Alejandro Alex Pompey was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2006. Now, good people, I don't know how to feel about old Alejandro, old Ali Al, I don't know how to feel about Alejandro, right? Cause he was a major figure. He was a major figure, one of the men who helped build black America. Without him, he might not have had the Negro League. Without him, might not have been a lot of things going on in Harlem, right? But son did work with them boys, right? <laughs> I don't know how to feel about that. But take it as you take it. Alejandro Alex Pompey. Good people, I introduce to you the debonair Baron Wilkins, born August 28th, 1866 in Portsmouth, Virginia. Now, not much is known about his childhood but we do know that he arrived in Harlem in 1903, around the age of 36 or 37. He took over a cabaret club that his brother formerly owned. 
He quickly gained a reputation throughout Harlem as a strong businessman. Everything and anything that happened in the city, it went through Behrman first. He had political clout and kept good relations with the police. You know, paying the boys off when they ran down on the club and all that for serving alcohol during prohibition, right? He was one of the most powerful men, black or white, in Harlem. Barron was known for sponsoring Jack Johnson, the heavyweight champion. Also, he funded mostly all of the Negro baseball teams, investing into real estate and property. One night, a local street punk by the name of Julius William Miller, better known as Yellow Charleston, was shooting dice and lost all of his money. He asked a friend for 50 cent. The friend gave him a quarter. Yellow wasn't too happy about that shit, right? He shot Sunday. Fleeing from the scene, he runs into Baron, who was standing in front of his nightclub, the exclusive club Incorporated. Yellow demanded $100 from Baron so that he could get out of town. When Baron refused, the coward ass Yellow shot and killed Baron Wilkins as well. When he found out that the two biggest gangsters in town was hunting him down, one being Bumpy Johnson and the other Bob Hewlett, the chump, who was scared, turned himself in. He was found guilty for double murder and sentenced to death by the electric chair. He was electrocuted in 1925. Baron Wilkins, good people, salute. Last, but definitely not least, the Godfather himself, Ellsworth Raymond Johnson, better known as the Notorious Bumpy Johnson. Born October 31st, 1905 in Charleston, South Carolina, to parents Margaret Moultrie and William Johnson. When Bumpy was 10 in 1915, his older brother, Willie, was accused of killing a white man. Afraid of the possibility? <laughs> nah, forget the possibility. The more than likely chance of a lynch mob? Margaret and William mortgaged their tiny home and raised enough money to send Willie up north. Ellsworth got the nickname Bumpy from a bump on the back of his head. As Bumpy grew older, his parents worried about his short temper and his insolence towards Caucasians. <laughs> hey, yo. <laughs> Bumpy ain't played no games with the white boys, right? But yo, listen, in 1919, Margaret and William once again mustered up enough money to send a little Bumpy to Harlem to live with his sister, Mabel. Bumpy dropped out of high school and hit the streets hard body. Petty crimes at first. Then he stepped his game up. He noticed other gangsters running a protection racket on the local stores. Most of the existing stores were under protection already. So Bumpy, good old Bumpy, jumped on the first new store to open up. He laid his pitch, and himself and his team, they began their racket. Now, I mentioned him before, and he was a big influence in Harlem and the era, but I wouldn't call him one of the black men who built America. This fella being William Bud Hewlett. Now, Bub, he had his team. The Bob Hewlett gang, well established, and contrary to popular belief, Bub actually took a liking to Bumpy. He became aware quick that Bumpy, even though a young 16-year-old, was no pushover. He admired the way Bumpy stood up to him when confronting him. The story goes like this. Bub and his gang ran down on a new shop uptown. To his surprise, when laying his pitch for protection, the owner stated, I already have protection. Bub Dax who? And the owner told him, Bumpy Johnson. Shortly after, Bumpy runs down. When confronted by Bub, Bumpy stood his ground. They worked out a deal where Bub would receive a small percentage of the take. And this began a long mentorship, father figure, and friendship with the young Bumpy. He took Bumpy under the wing and showed him the ropes. Now Bumpy and his team was getting tired. With that came frequent trips to prison. A scared beard here, a stretch there. 
All throughout his young years, Bumpy was in and out the joint. After a bid, Bumpy's back uptown and he begins working as lieutenant for the number two, only questionable to Casper Holstein, the number two numbers runner in NYC, and that being the infamous Madame Stephanie St. Clair. Right smack in the middle of a numbers takeover war by the crazy Jew mobster Dutch Schultz, who had ties to the commission, the National Crime Syndicate ran by Lucky Luciano. Queen, Queen was a strong, no-nonsense woman, and with Bumpy joining her, was all she needed. Many policy bankers and number runners folded, including Big Bob Hewlett, who went to work for Dutch, but not Queen. She fought to the end. Towards the end of the war, the commission grew sick of Dutch and his ways. Lucky Luciano had enough of Schultz and ordered Murder Incorporated to take care of it. And take care of it they did, catching Dutch at his favorite restaurant and making sure that that was the last meal Dutch would ever eat. Dutch made it to the hospital and died 22 hours after arrival. On his deathbed, Queenie, check out Queenie, yo, check out Queenie. On his deathbed, Queenie sent Dutch a nice telegram stating, As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Hey, yo, Queenie played no games, right? Now again, I stated that Bumpy was back and forth in the Hooskow. In prison, he protected an Italian mob figure. This gained the respect of the mob. While in prison, Bumpy studied the ways of the mob, the structure, the discipline, and the order. Back on the streets, Bumpy formed his organization under mafia structure. With the respect of the mob, he gained access to mafia ties, which allowed him access to the go-to drug at the time, which was heroin and the notorious French connection. Bumpy ruled Harlem with the iron fist, remaining a gentleman and a gangster. Along with the street side, Bumpy also had a militant side, befriending Malcolm X, Adam Clayton Powell, and many more black leaders of the time. Bumpy, during his lifetime, made sure Uptown stayed black, the legal world as well as the underworld. Ellsworth Raymond Johnson, better known as Bumpy, the godfather of Harlem. Salute.